let's turn to God's word, to the Gospel of Luke, and chapter 2, and we're going to be looking at verses 21 through to uh, 40, and I'll read them as we go along. Now, I was standing outside this morning, and uh, a lady came past, and she looked at me, and she said, ah, it's a good church. And I said, thank you. And then she started laughing and said, you're kidding, and just walked off and laughing. And I thought, well, that's the devil. Um, but it's interesting. It's interesting the things that we think about, interesting the things that encourage us and the things that discourage us. And as we come towards the end of the year, I think it's worthwhile us reflecting on the things that we care about. Um, if we list the things that have happened this year, if you do that, I think what you list will indicate what you care about. So, for example, in the Sydney Morning Herald, uh, I, I fa found this. I thought it was quite fascinating. Uh, Australians had a lot on their minds coming into 2023. When asked what keeps them up at night, this is what they said. Can we go on to the next slide, please? Um, they go, 25% were worried about their financial well-being. 23% were worried about not saving enough money. 21% were worried about personal physical health. And 20% were worried about their own mental health. Um, and the Herald went on to say, we want to know what matters to you so our journalism helps enrich your life. Here are some articles we wrote with your health, wealth, and happiness in mind. And I thought, I wonder if I wrote them and said, uh, spiritual health is of great importance, whether they'd let me write a weekly column, but I figured they probably wouldn't. Um, how do we think about these things? What do we look for when we go into a new year? You can see it as a beginning. Um, you can make resolutions. I always do. Uh, I uh, looked up an article. I think this was from America. The top eight New Year's resolutions were one, exercise more, two, eat healthier, three, lose weight, four, save more money, five, spend more time with family and friends, six was interesting, spend less time on social media, uh, seven, reduce stress on the job, and eight, reduce spending on living expenses. Well, these resolutions, it's a good idea to have resolutions. But for those of us who are Christians, and even for those of you who are not Christians, I think that what we need to resolve and need to think about is our relationships, but particularly our relationship with God. So we're going to go back to uh, the beginning. We're going to look at Christ, and uh, we're going to look at six aspects of what happened to him in this as a child. Luke chapter 2 is about Jesus' birth, but it's also about uh, virtually all that we know about his childhood. So if you go to verse 21, it says this, On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. Circumcision, of course, was the old covenant mark that God gave uh, to his people. And they were told to do it on the eighth day, Leviticus 12, verse 3, for example. So his parents were devout Jews, and they wanted to ensure that, yes, this was done properly. And it was done properly. Now, in one sense, this isn't surprising. But there's another sense in which, well, maybe you don't think like this, but I do. There are questions that you ask. And one is, circumcision was done not just as a sign of God's covenant, but it was the, the, the meaning of it was to cut away and to cut away sin, just as baptism was to die to sin. But this child is sinless. He's the only one who doesn't need to be circumcised in heart. So why is he being circumcised? And later on, 
Why was he baptized? When he went to John the Baptist to be baptized, John said, no, 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 I'm not doing this. I'm the one who needs to be baptized. You don't need to be baptized. Well, the answer is, it's a very profound answer, actually, and one we maybe skip over. He entered the world to remove the sins of his people. He carried our sins and our guilt. He was baptized for us. He was circumcised for us. So, for example, there are numerous passages, but Isaiah 53, probably the best known. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. The pain of Christ is not restricted to the cross. The suffering of Christ does not begin at the cross. It is absolute and intensified at the cross. But almost everything is leading up to that. As a child, we know very little about him. He went through the pain of circumcision. For us, as a baby, um, we know that his father died probably while he was a teenager, so he experienced that. He experienced many things. But I love what Luke does here, or what is done here, because as well as the circumcision, they have the naming of Jesus, and the two didn't always go together. In fact, it was unusual for them to go together. Uh, It wasn't like people term an infant baptism, a christening, a, a giving a Christian name. But he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before. So there's already this um, connection between the life of Christ and the person of Christ and saving us from our sins. So let's go on to verses 22 to 24. Because after being circumcised, this happened. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, this would be another 40 days later. Joseph and Mary took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord. And to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what was said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now, what's quoted here is is the Old Testament law. And one of the ways that you can help understand books like Leviticus is to see them as pointing forward to Christ. So in Leviticus 12, verse 6, when the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. Now, a lot of people don't like these, these purification laws, and people try and explain what they mean. One of them is, is a very interesting one in terms of actual hygiene. So, for example, the Jewish people were very particular about washing their hands, and it wasn't just a ritual thing, though it was a ritual thing as well. Um, they asked for what they wanted, not just washing hands in a basin, which was the normal, but washing in running water. And uh, it's interesting, it took us a long time to, for human beings to catch up with that. I remember reading Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who was from Wales, a great Welsh preacher, and he was t- talking about how in the 1930s, when he was a medical doctor in London, before he became uh, a pastor, that uh, he actually considered it sinful to have more than two or three baths a year um, uh, now we're in a stage where, you know, you've got to have en suite in your, you know, you, you take a shower at least once a day and so on. But that, this kind of um, cleanliness, certainly in Western society, was, uh, was particular actually for, for the Jews, the Jewish people. But that wasn't the primary purpose of all of this. The purpose of it was to show that we are sinful people and we need to be cleansed. Now, part of that process was that you were grateful to God for your children. We sang Psalm 127. Remember that 
Many women would die in childbirth, and many children would die before they were five years old. And what the custom was, what God asked, was that the firstborn should be presented as an offering to God. Not that they were to be sacrificed, that was something that the heathen did, it wasn't something that God's people did. But that it was a, a, a dedication. So Samuel, for example, was dedicated, offered to God for service. Exodus 13, verse 1. Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether human or animal. And when this presentation was done, the child was given. And God, in, the idea was that God could take this child. The child could die, but you paid a redemption fee. And so the child was redeemed. And that's what's happening here. Jesus is coming as the redeemer. You see why this is important. Jesus is coming as the redeemer, but the redeemer is redeemed. He was circumcised. He got this redemption fee in in the temple. He was to be baptized. Now, he was sinless. So in what sense was he redeemed? Well, again, because he was to carry all of our sin. Jesus belonged to the tribe not of Levi, but of Judah, and had to be exempted from official temple service by the payment of five shekels of service. He was born under the law. He was born under the sentence of death. He was duty-bound to carry the law's penalty, but he did it for us. That's part of his humiliation. So it's uh, this consecration, this dedication of Jesus. You think about it in another way as well. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It's such a famous verse, John 3, 16, such a well-known verse. We, We skip by it. But just as Mary and Joseph went and dedicated Jesus, there's a sense in which God had already given Jesus for us. So it's that consecration. Then verses 25 to 32, we look at the consolation. There was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations." a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people, Israel. That picture up there, by the way, that's uh, Rembrandt's famous painting of Simeon with the child Jesus. Now, Simeon's a fascinating character. First of all, he he wasn't a priest. He wasn't a clergyman. Um, And yet he's described as righteous and devout He's, he's what, um, in today's language, although I, I don't like this language, we would call a, a layman or a layperson. But he's described as being righteous, as was Mary's husband Joseph, Matthew 1.19, as was Mary herself, and as were Zechariah and Elizabeth, and Joseph of Arimathea. What does that mean, righteous and devout? It means that they took seriously what God said. And they tried to follow God's law, but they also knew that they needed their sins to be forgiven. Maybe um, in terms of people understand this, that Simeon was righteous in regard to other people, that he looked uh, to help other people, love your neighbor as yourself. And he was devout towards God, love God with all your heart and soul and mind. But 
the two key things about him here are this. One, well, we, we, um, I should say as well, we know he's old. He was, he's waiting. And he's waiting for the consolation of Israel. And he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was a man whose hope, as he lived in a society which seemed to be going downhill, his hope was in what he called the consolation of Israel, the hope of Israel. And he's waiting and waiting, and then he's filled with the Spirit, and he goes into the temple courts. And in come Mary and Joseph to do what the law required them to do, the purification, and to pay the redemption fee. And he goes and he takes Jesus in his arms, and he praises God. It's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture. Incidentally, as we go back through Luke chapters 1 and 2, you'll notice how often song comes in. Uh, Elizabeth's song of love, Mary's song of faith, Zechariah's song of hope, Simon's song of, I, I think, uh, Simeon's song, rather, of just joy and hope and of, of self-surrender to the Lord. You may now dismiss your servant in peace. What's he saying? He's saying, I've seen, that's enough. Even the baby, it's enough. I can die now in peace. It's an extraordinary testimony. He entrusts himself to death, knowing that life and immortality have been brought to light through the gospel. He believes that God's word is being fulfilled and he's ready to die. I think some of us, Many people, I've seen this happen with people, they get to a blessed position where they are ready to die. They don't need to be euthanized. They're not saying, get me out of here. But they've seen enough, not just of the evils of the world or even of the good of the world, but they've seen enough of Christ that they are ready. They are absolutely ready. And it's a question I ask, I doubt that all of us will be here this time next year. Are we ready? Are we ready to die? It seems, in one sense, such a morbid thing to say. But it's such an important thing for all of us, young and old alike. Verse 26, we had this... Uh, this he, it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Messiah. And now he's seen it. Incidentally, notice this as well. Um, my eyes have seen your salvation. Notice that he, it, it's not a narrow thing because he sees it as for the Gentiles, for the world outside of Israel. And that was in line with the rest of the Old Testament. That was in line with what, what is to come in the New Testament. But it wasn't really in line with his culture. That's not how people thought. And I think, again, for us, the more we see Christ, the more we should realize that he's not just for us. He's for people all around. Then verses 33, let's read on with this. The challenge that comes. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, this child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Notice what happens. He speaks to Mary, not to Joseph. Joseph was going to die. Joseph wasn't going to see this. And he says to Mary, a sword will pierce your heart. And what he means by that is you will experience great sorrow because of this child. And it doesn't, how, how, it's not really a blessing, is it? I mean, imagine if we had an, an infant dedication here or a baptism and I was to say to the mother, you're going to really suffer because of this child. It would be extraordinary. But that's what he does. He was at the cross saying, well, that's Jesus dying for us, and that's what we expect, and I'm, I'm quite chilled about it. He, she would be utterly distraught at what was happening to her son, and then she would remember this. 
But Jesus, you see, it's so interesting. I've read so many Christmas messages, and virtually nearly all the clergy I've read, they're kind of saying things like, Jesus is for the whole world, and he's going to bring peace, and, and all the rest of it. And nobody says he's going to be a sign that will be spoken against. Everyone likes Jesus. No, they don't. Isaiah 8, 14, he will be a holy place for both Israel and Judah. He will be a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And for the people of Jerusalem, he will be a trap and a snare. Simeon is saying, Jesus has come for us Jews, and we're going to reject him. Many of us are going to reject him. And the Gentiles as well. His own did not receive him. This child is set for the falling and rising of many in Israel. And what's being said here is the attitude towards Jesus is in decisive of where we spend our eternal destiny. Some would reject him, others would accept him. And it has always been the same. So a lady walks past the church something to be mocked. Maybe she'll come to see Christ. I pray she will come to see Christ and accept him. But we present Christ to people. It doesn't mean that all these people are going to accept him. In fact, people talk about all our strategies and techniques and everything. But at the end of the day, there are those who will reject and there are those who will accept. And that includes within the church as well. And again, I just ask simply, the only way you can be prepared for death is by knowing Christ. And then verses 36 to 38, we read of another amazing person, the prophet Anna. There was also a prophet Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She'd lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84 or either... She was a widow for 84 years, is probably the better translation. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. She's very old. Uh, I think she was probably 105 around that time. Um, 84, it's possible but she lived as a widow, I think, for, for longer, uh, for that period. I think that's really what it says. And, you know, 84, some of you think that 84 is, uh, well, not that old. I remember visiting an old folks' home, sorry if you're not allowed to call it that, and saying to one, one of the women, you know, nice to meet you, what do you do? <laughs> she looked at me and she laughed and she said, oh, I look after the old ones. And I said, well, what do you mean, the old ones? I said, how old are you? She says, I'm 92. I said, well, who are the old ones? She's 101, she's 103, she's 105. I thought, okay, everything is relative in that regard. But this woman was 100 and maybe 105 years old. She was a, and she was a prophetess. It's, it's fascinating. Her name means grace. Anna just means grace. She's a widow, a daughter of Phanul, um, which is the Hebrew name Penuel. And if you know your Bibles, you will know that Jacob was left alone at the river Jabbok where he wrestled with the angel and he called the place Penuel. For I have seen God face to face, yet, face to face, yet my life is preserved. Genesis 32, 30. Um, Anna belonged to the tribe of Asher. And Asher was the second son of Leah's husband, Zilpah. Um, Asher is also a great name because it's a name that means happy and his birth made Leah happy. The word, the term, the name Anna is just equivalent to Hannah. Now, she was a prophetess, she had divine insight, and was able to recognize who the child in the temple was. So you have Simeon and you have Anna. As far as we know, they are not connected. She also was greatly devoted to God. She never left the temple but worshipped night and day. And it doesn't mean literally she never ever left the temple. It meant she was there every single day at all the, and there were daily 
services and rituals. Um, incidentally, the fact that Luke knows what tribe Anna belongs to is part of the, the history of the people that we're dealing with, that the Jews kept their family registers and genealogies up to date. And that's why when you read a book like Chronicles and you get these long lists of names and you think, what's the point of that? And, when, and as we're reading through the Bible, one of you is going to have the blessing of having to read those, all those names. And it's, it really, uh, we had a gentleman do it in my previous church at one point and he read through, I think, one of the chapters in Chronicles and at the end the congregation just burst into applause because it was a real uh, feat. But these names are there for a reason. For many years, there had been little prophecy in Israel, for about 400 years probably, from the end of Malachi. And now suddenly, you've got some, like Anna is one of them. She was a prophetess. Uh, Philip had four unmarried daughters who had the gift of prophecy, Acts 21.9. A true prophet or prophetess was one who, having received revelation of the mind and will of God, then goes on to say what has been given. Um, we can talk about the gift of prophecy today, but I think in the sense of the way that Anna had it when there was no New Testament revelation, I don't think that we have that today. But notice what she brings. She just brings great comfort. She comes up to them at that very moment, at the moment when Mary is being told a sword will pierce your soul. And she comes to that moment and gives thanks to God and she speaks about this child. And again, of course, Joseph and Mary would remember this. And then the last thing we're just gonna note is verses 39 and 40. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee to their own town of Nazareth and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was upon him. Jesus developed as a normal child. He develops as a normal child. We don't know, we know very little about Jesus. There are apocryphal gospels, which are false gospels, which have ridiculous things like him making clay pigeons, clapping his hands and they come to life. No, no. Jesus was a normal child. You wouldn't, there would be nothing about Jesus that would have struck you. He continued to grow and become strong. There's a, an element there in the, in the physical this human body that Jesus had. Um, there were things that Jesus had to learn. He didn't know everything. That also is important for, to realize. He had to go to school. He would learn the scriptures, had to learn to memorize the scriptures. He grew physically, he grew mentally. And we know from Hebrews that he learned obedience from what he suffered. And all of that is, is quite extraordinary. And why did he do that? The grace of God was on him because he was to become the perfect sacrifice, the one who lived with no sin, who then gave himself for our sins. So I want to come to the, the question of the week before we finish and uh, ask, what's your hope for the new year? Um, I, I don't, do you see the extraordinary story of the new baths at Newcastle Beach that, uh, uh, at the baths there, uh, 40 kilograms of cocaine uh, washed up and, you know, there's plenty of people who would have thought that was just a great gift for them. Um, there have been people who've been going up and down the coast between Sydney and Newcastle to see if they can get some of this uh, cocaine that's floating around and thankfully most people have handed it in when they when they found it well I guess maybe people they would consider it wouldn't that be wonderful if you're addicted to cocaine and there are sadly too many people who are or you, you saw it as a way of making money maybe um, our hopes we think in terms of political hopes uh, you'll get all the new year's messages from popes and princes and politicians, peace in Ukraine, Israel, Gaza, Myanmar, hope that China won't invade Taiwan, that in Venezuela won't invade Guyana, that Turkey won't invade Armenia. There are people 
Uh, there was an article in one of the European newspapers about the hope for climate change in this coming year. And we'll get all these hopes. Some people's hopes are on more mundane things like um, sport. Uh, I understand that the Newcastle Jets won yesterday, and I understand that this is quite an unusual experience. And I, I saw in the paper that they were saying, we hope that this is the beginning of a new start for us. Um, well, possibly. Um, we have personal hopes. We, we, you know, uh, Forbes magazine has personal improved fitness is a hope for 48% of people. Improved finances, 38%. Improved mental health, 36%. Lose weight, 34%. Improved diet, 32%. What's the problem with all these hopes and even the resolutions that come from them? The problem is the second Friday in January, which is now known officially as Quitter Friday. So you start with these great hopes. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And the vast majority are over and done with by the second Friday in January. If our hope is in ourselves or in other people, the Bible says don't trust in princes, our hopes will be dashed. And there are some people, some of you are already there. Why? Well, you're saying, why bother with hope? I just don't think about things. I just get on with things and hope it'll turn out all right. Well, I'm sorry, that's a hope. You just hope that you muddle on and everything will be okay. You hope you survive. But there is one place or one person we can hope in. We see in this passage the hope, the consolation of Israel. So that Heidelberg Catechism, what is your only comfort in life and death? One of the dangers of us just saying things is we just say them. We don't think about them. But what a comfort it is to say, I'm not my own, but belong body and soul in life and death to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood. He set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ by his Holy Spirit assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Our only hope in life and death, and this is hope in the sense of certainty, the only certainty that we can have going into this new year is that Christ is our hope. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Rock of ages, cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. That's our hope. And I ask simply if you have that hope, because otherwise everything you hope for is hopeless. And let me just finish by going through those six C's that we looked at for Christ. And just let me ask you questions that are connected with that. So with circumcision, the Bible speaks about circumcision of the heart, being cut to the heart. Has that happened to you? Are you aware of your sin and the need for Christ to cleanse? I don't mean just in the sense of, yeah, of course I'm a sinner, but that's the way it is. I mean in the sense of you feel it, you know it, you know it. Consecration. Are you prepared to dedicate yourself and your family to Christ? Joshua said to the people, you do what you want, but as for me and my household, we are going to serve the Lord. Consolation, hope. Well, we've just spoken about that. If it's in Christ, you can't lose. It's a sure and certain hope, an absolute certain hope. People might say to me, hey, what, what's, your, what's your hope for Scots Kirk? And I'm saying, well, I, I don't really have one. Except simply this, that like everybody else and like every other church, our situation is so desperate, our only hope is Christ. But what a hope. The challenge. You must know that 2024 is going to be a year of challenges. The question is, are you going to face these challenges on your own or are you going to face them with Christ? The comfort do you give thanks to God or are you constantly moaning about all the bad things that keep happening to you and to others 
and you forget to give thanks for the child and all the blessings that he brings. And the last is simply character. He was filled with wisdom and the grace of God was on him. McShane used to pray this very simple prayer, Lord, make me as holy as a pardoned sinner can be. That should be your resolution. Not, I'm going to be really holy, but your resolution should be, Lord, make me holy. Make me holy. Make me like Christ. Let me think like Christ. Thomas Brooks says this, it is good when the life of a Christian is a commentary on Christ's life. So, in this coming year, may it be that there are people in Newcastle who would say, when I see them, I see Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its power and its beauty. We thank you above all that it speaks of you. You are our consolation, our hope. You challenge us. You also comfort us. We pray that we would have your character, that you would give us the fruit of your spirit. We consecrate the gifts that we have. We sang that song. Our minds, our intellects, our, our finances, our bodies, our homes, everything. Lord, we give them to you, for they are yours anyway. And we ask that you would use us for your glory, that you would bless your people in this place. We pray over this coming year that you would fill this church with people who have come to see the consolation and the hope of Israel. May your hand be upon us, for we ask it in your name. Amen. I trust in his goodness, trust in his